So um, I think we're going to start. There might be some people still walking in um, because there was a show also, wonderful um, scholarship show that's uh, happening in our gallery. But um, I think we'll start up. And um, I want to first welcome you all here. Um, it's, uh, it's, this is the first Steve Wilson Lectures, and um, it's going to be an ongoing uh, series that happens one, uh, once in the fall. Um, we'll be bringing artists in to speak, uh, make a public talk, and meet our students, and um, basically create a forum for uh, the intersection that Steve spent oh, 30 years developing, which is art, science, technology, and culture. So everyone who comes into this series will sh be sharing that same intersection. You know, and the goal is, and I think it will happen, that over time, you know, we'll have a nice community just it already exists, but we'll have a bigger community that, are, that will be kind of in that same place. Lots of crossovers, lots of cross conversations, and pretty interesting work. Um, it's my absolute privilege and honor to welcome Joseph DeLapp here tonight. Um, and I'm going to uh, talk about Joe uh, in, in, a few, in a few minutes. Um, I want to just say that these talks are supported through the generosity of the Steve Wilson Fund for Conceptual Information Arts. Um, and also with thanks to his wife, Dr. Kathy Witzling, and his daughter, Sophia Wilson. Um, the Steve Wilson Lectures are part of the Graduate Program Visiting Artist Lecture Series, and we'll have Susan uh, Bailu, who's the coordinator for the Graduate Program, uh, speak on behalf of that, of that program. Um, so I want to begin by introducing Gail Dawson, who's the chair of the Art Department who's going to be talking a little bit about Steve and the department, and uh, then followed by Susan Bailu. Then I'll be back to specifically introduce Joe. Thank you all for coming. It's absolutely thrilling to see you all here for this. So thanks. So welcome, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm going to read from something, because I'll get lost if I try to um, I try to be extemporaneous. So bear with me as I look down and up. I'll try to project loudly enough so you can hear me. Um, I want to thank you all for coming, as did Paula. Um, and thank you for your efforts, in particular, Paula, to get all of this off the ground. It's Herculean, to say the least. Um, we're here to ensure that Steve Wilson is honored as the pioneer that he was, while highlighting the ways the intersecting fields of art, culture, science, and technology are moving into territory that perhaps even Steve might not have imagined. An academic department in a state university, which is what we are, offers a complex set of shifting tableaus, populated by faculty, students, staff, and the occasional wandering administrator. Some are transient, some are permanent, and I want to offer a few quick snapshots of Steve Wilson from these tableaus from my perspective as a department faculty member, which is how I knew him. In meetings, the whole faculty are in a committee. Steve was generous and critical. I recall him as more an idealist than a pragmatist, and in that sense, he played a very important role that every department needs, and he played it well. I don't recall ever hearing him raise his voice, but he did raise objections, and he posed questions both of which were founded in his idealism about art and education, as well as the future of the discipline. He was an important voice in reminding us that our, uh, whoop, 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 sorry, he was an important voice in reminding us of our primary mission, teaching. And I cannot recall a single meeting where he was not eating his lunch. <laughs> Steve was an active and curious viewer of artworks. I recall the first senior exhibition, the first year of my higher here, and I bumped into Steve, who was marveling at a sculpture. What is it, he asked, as he circled the pedestal. He gave each object in the room his attention and remained open and curious about each and every one of them, giving them their due, and in absentia, acknowledged the time, thought, and integrity of every artist. My strongest memories of Steve, however, center on his engagement with the graduate program. Because he was Steve Wilson, many students came to our MFA program to study with him. What he gave his graduate students was his attention, his curiosity, his commitment, his intelligence, and his experience. He spoke to students as fully developed humans, as equals working together. 
He offered insights into their ideas that would help them grow in their thinking and as artists. Two students in particular come to mind who graduated several years ago, Jessica Walker and Cy Ternatsky. Both were dedicated to working across disciplines to generate works of art that challenged assumptions about history, technology, and culture. Both recognize that we're living in a time when the meaning of all three is at stake. Jessica and Cy received their MFAs and entered the world at large. Jessica was, Walker received a Fulbright after graduate school in which she went to Australia and investigated all the Jessica Walkers within certain regions of the country, a project that explored the nature of the internet, identity, and politics. She now teaches digital media in the undergraduate program at Parsons New School of Design. Cy Tornaski was hired right out of uh, graduate school into the art department at Colorado State University. Her charge was to develop a digital media or an electronic media emphasis. And two years ago, that emphasis opened to the undergraduates in that, in that curriculum in a form that closely mirrors that of conceptual and information arts here. We miss Steve Wilson's contributions to the department, but most of all, we miss his humanity. And cliche though it may be, I can say that he lives on in the actions and thoughts of his former students and those of us who knew him. I hope that the Steve Wilson Lecture Series is another way that Steve will remain present in our lives more broadly and for those students who knew him and those who didn't have a chance. Susan Balo, and I'm current uh, acting, well, I'm current graduate coordinator of the art department here at San Francisco State. Um, and I want to add my welcome to Joseph DeLapp, and also my thanks to those who have made the Steve Wilson Lecture Series possible. Um, our graduate programs include a two-year MA program and also a three-year MFA program in studio art. Uh, the MA program is in art history. Um, Steve Wilson worked primarily in the studio uh, MFA program. What do I do? There we go. Um, and so our, our, our MFA program is a three-year program. Uh, we generally have, you know, 15 to 20 students in that program. And it's an interdisciplinary program in which students can um, work across media, and then they also work closely with faculty and their peers who come from a range of studio practice. And one important um, aspect of this philosophy in our department is our long-standing visiting artist lecture series. Um, the current um, program involves, you know, th inviting three visiting artists to our campus each semester the artists give a lecture and then also have an opportunity to give studio critiques to our graduate students. Um, and we are thrilled to add the annual Steve Wilson lectures to that program uh, to continue to enrich our students' experience and um, exposure to contemporary artists. That's it. So uh, Steve was a tremendous proponent of artists um, being proactive pioneers, first respondents, as opposed to cons just consumers of technology. He wrote about that uh, often, and in particular in relationship to his own work, um, not only learning te new technologies, but also he loved taking them apart, as most of you know, technically and culturally, uh, and what he described as doing the provocative and the un unexpected with them. Um, so in putting this lecture series together, the goal was to try to find artists who shared that same intersection as Steve, and Joe DeLapp is certainly one of them. Joe enacts, performs, intervenes, constructs and deconstructs using whatever media or tools available. His work and subject matter ranges from large transgressive cultural acts, such as war and death, uh, to the daily, mundane, everyday actions of doing taxes, working, or playing. Um, as an agent of change, he unmakes and remakes his subject through scale, humor, 
and particularly absurdities, shifting and destabilizing the matters at hand as well as our familiar relationships to it. For example, his interventions in gaming through machinima, and God knows I mispronounce words, so please just shout it out if that's incorrect. Um, machinima, using America's army, which is a propaganda tool for recruitment, he turned into a project called Dead in Iraq. His newest work as an artist in residence in Instructables here in San Francisco is a wearable predator drone apparel uh, to personalize one's own drone uh, system and, learn, and, and help to have individuals learn to live with a sky full of drones. His, um, his work collapses the safety of distance that's created through our media um, and uh, or gaming uh, or wars elsewhere. And he makes the viewers or, and players aware of the consequences that lay outside of the simulation that we see. That last phrase was a wonderful uh, description from an interview of Joe by Matthias Jansen, uh, which is online. Joe is a professor of art at the University of Nevada and the director of their digital media program. He's worked in electronic and new media for 31 years. So this man is a pioneer in the field, and uh, he, we are thrilled to have him here today. He's exhibited and performed worldwide, including China, Germany, Canada, and Australia. He's shown in the uh, 798 Beijing Biennial, the ICEA 09 in Ireland, and the International Video and Electronic Arts Festival in Mexico City. He's, uh, he's, he's showing, ex, uh, his ex exhibitions are quite extensive, and that's just a very small um, snapshot. It's a tremendous, tremendous pleasure to welcome Joe Delap here today. That was great, thank you, Paula. Um, I, I have to say, it, it's truly an honor to be here. Um, when Paula called me and, and informed me of the, the creation of this lecture series and that I would be the first uh, speaker, I was truly moved. Um, I had the opportunity of, of meeting and, and working with uh, Steve. Hang on, let me show my wireless off here. That's what's I don't know if that's ever gonna, no. Well, we may just have to keep hitting that. Um, I, I, I had the opportunity of working with Steve in the 80s. Uh, he was a friend of Joel Slayton, who started the cadre program at San Jose State, where I uh, received my master's degree in 1990. Uh, Steve was actually, came to San Jose State a couple times while I was in school, but the uh, most memorable experience was a summer workshop series that was at Cal Poly. I think it was 86 or 85, and, and he was one of the artists who worked with us as students on, on projects. And he did this crazy project with a Amiga computer, as I remember. No, not Amiga, uh, Commodore 64. I can't remember, anyway. But he, he, put, he, he put sensors out in the, in the ocean waves to have the, the waves hit the sensors and make sound and, and movement on the screen. And um, it worked for about 15 seconds before the <laughs> salt deteriorated the sensors and um, I just love Steve. He was fantastic. He's a person I would run into at conferences and Isaiah and things like that later on and he was just a joy. Like there was no pretension. He was just this guy you could talk to and he was always interested in what you were doing. I just, I, I loved him. He was great. So um, thank you very much and really, really glad to be here. Um, so I'm going to give you a, um, a history of, of, of work, really mostly since 9-11, with a few precursors. Uh, I'm going to go through some early work quickly, but it is rather important to kind of see it because it does feed into where things are now. Um, this was a, a project part of a, a series of, of reconfigurations of desktop computer mice, um, but probably the most important of the series is called the Artist Mouse, and this was essentially like a reverse engineering of an Apple desktop mouse to become a, a drawing and mapping tool. So I would use this essentially to um, map literally with pencil all of my computer time, right? So um, and when I, when I created this thing, I was like, okay, what's going to make some interesting drawings with this? And I had just started getting interested in computer gaming, mostly by way of my students. And so the, the first project 
kind of conceptual project I did with this work was called Playing Unreal. And Unreal was, this was an early shooter game, this was before it was online. And I played levels of the game replacing my mouse pad with uh, 10 by 10 inch sheets of rag paper and made these drawings. And they were just kind of interesting and fascinating and, and this, this sort of marking. Um, but this was how I first incorporated computer gaming into my work, which was kind of fun too because I could, um, you know, my wife's like, are you playing those games again? I was like, no, I'm making art. So, right? um, which was really quite fun, but and true, right? It's like it's research, right? Um, but it began to really become this obsessive thing where, like, these ones, each one's about this big record. Each of those is about a month of all of my computer time from playing games, surfing the internet, writing papers for conferences, memos for the university, playing games, etc. Um, this was one that I did on my desk when I was chair, which was really boring. <laughs> Same, because we were doing the same thing all the time. Um, but this became pivotal in terms of incorporating gameplay into the work and, and, and exploring these notions of, of play. Um, these games that I was playing and, and you know, in, in between doing work and, and things started in, uh, evolving to being online contexts, right? These, these situations where you were playing against other players from throughout the world through a dedicated servers. I began to be really curious about the texting that was going on. The communication in these spaces was all through the keyboard. And I thought that was really kind of anachronistic, you know, that you're playing in these 3D virtual world, worlds, but you have to communicate in this 19th century keyboard, right? And so I had this whim of an idea to perform using that texting. So this is actually a screenshot from my first ever performance in a computer game called Howl Elite Force Voyager Online. And I went into a Star Trek shooter game uh, based on the Voyager uh, series. <laughs> and instead of playing, my character's name was Allen Ginsberg. And I was a neutral. I didn't shoot, but I would just stand still and I typed over a six hour period uh, Allen Ginsberg seminal beat poem Howl, word for word. Um, and this was intense. This was like just ridiculous and silly and kind of stupid. And I, I had no idea whether this was interesting or even art or performance. Um, but in, as things go, it turns out it's one of the, it, it is one of the earliest examples of an artist performing within a shooter game um, and became really pivotal in my work as things went. And I'm not showing you a lot of projects here, sculptural uh, creations, electromechanical installations and things. I'm, going to try to get to the present as quickly as possible here. Um, there were several other iterations of experiments. This was one that was probably most significant. Um, I enlisted a group of five of my students and myself, and we all entered the same Quake game space as characters from the TV show Friends. And instead, of, <laughs> instead of playing, we reenacted an episode from the show. And um, this was nuts. I mean, it was... It was total chaos. We were all neutral. We eventually restaged it in the Shepherd Gallery at the University of Nevada. And we had each point of view projected and sound for each. And each performer was reading as they were typing. So it's this really <laughs> strange kind of dialogue with, you know, headshot, all these things going on. Um, it was just it was just a sight to behold. Uh, interesting experience with this. Uh, this Got picked up by a writer for the New York Times, which was really exciting. And then the next day, got a phone call from an attorney from Warner Brothers Television, threatening me with copyright uh, <laughs> lawsuit, etc. And landed up kind of fighting them back and um, went on with the performance anyway. But it was really kind of amazing to get that kind of. Um, it was sort of almost going viral. It was like going viral, essentially getting something in that kind of context that just people knew about it and, and this idea of doing something different in these spaces. And, and very importantly, thinking about these online game contexts as a new type of public space, right? That, that these server environments, these virtual spaces were like being on the street. It, it was such sort of a new public square in a way, and I was treating it as such. Um, other things I was working on, I, I, do, I, I did a lot of kind of, um, uh, very intense electromechanical interactive kind of sculpture kind of stuff in the 90s and this was a piece 
that I was working on in between uh, 2004 and 2006. Uh, very briefly, it was a it was called War Movie, and it had uh, four independent cameras with a switcher box digital thing that kind of switched randomly between the cameras, and I was creating these miniature 30, 135th scale dioramas of scenes from the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts that would be these moving dioramas, and so you would watch this online and you would think you were watching a kind of ongoing documentary of the war. Um, crazy intense project that I was not finished with, and my studio was destroyed by a flood at our home in Reno, and so lost everything. Um, and uh, all my slides, all my, you know, just, it was, this was pretty awful, but uh, uh, I did have my laptop with me and I had an idea that I had been sitting on for some time that came to the fore, um, in, in part in reaction to this. Um, so 9-11, uh, this is the website that was published, uh, I think it came out in 2000, uh, January 2004, I think is when this was published. Um, this is the website that still exists. It's all 5,201 entries for the memorial for the World Trade Center site. And I remember when this was published thinking, wow, that's really great. They're making this public art process public in a very big way. But this was also just under a year into our invasion in, of Iraq. And I remember thinking, oh, we'll never do a memorial like this to the thousands of civilian casualties in Iraq that had already happened at that time. And also began thinking about what would be the next, you know, Maya Lin uh, memorial style, you know, Vietnam Veterans Memorial. What would be our memorial to our soldiers who were dying in ever greater, greater numbers? And it just kind of, a couple ideas came out of this. Um, but questions about memorial. Um, what, what, is it, what, what does it mean? What is, how do they function? Um, and, you know, just... Uh, a few examples, Iwo Jima, this is a World War I memorial in uh, Toronto to our glorious dead. Uh, my Lynn's uh, memorial in Washington, D.C., very controversial when it came out, but fascinating that it's literally a gash in the, uh, in the National Mall at the most visited site in Washington, D.C. at this point. Um, that's a, a protest and a memorial at the same time, from my point of view. Um, and what does it mean to protest, right? Uh, the Iraq conflict, the intense patriotic fervor that we all experienced, you know, in the, the 70 percent of Americans <coughs> polled who believed that Saddam Hussein was somehow involved in 9-11, etc. All these things, you know, uh, what do you do? What do you do as an artist? And I do have to say that 9-11 and our reaction to it as a country really uh, pushed my work into a very political direction. Um, I've always been politicized, but it really came to the fore in my work. And one of the prime activities that uh, manifested that was this, um, America's Army. Um, if you're not aware, America's Army game has been around since July 4th, 2002. It was actually under development long before 9-11 um, uh, to create a uh, First-person shooter game as a recruiter, recruiting tool for um, to bring young people to join the military. Because before 9/11, they were really having a hard time attracting recruits. Um, after 9/11, it wasn't so much a problem. Um, so um, hopefully this video will work. Yes. So this is actually a, a, a machinima uh, documentary kind of piece that I've made, showing what I decided to do in this game space. And I'll, I'll describe it as it, as it kind of goes along. Maybe I can turn the lights down here a little bit too. So, America's Army game, you basically join, and you are, you'll see in a second here, you're with your platoon of fellow humans. Game starts and you run off. I drop my weapon. Um, and generally I find a location, using the point of view, and if you look on the top left, instead of playing, I'm using the text messaging system to type in the names of actual U.S. military casualties. Um, as in this uh, sequence, I generally get shot very quickly. 
um, usually by the enemy, sometimes by friendly fire. Um, in this game, you die once until the next round, but once you die, you kind of float over your avatar. Um, it's like a spirit. And I would just keep typing until the next round, and, and so on, and, and so on. And um, I started this in March of 2006, roughly to coincide with the anniversary of the start of the Iraq conflict. Um, and this was a, a kind of private act. I, I was really kind of nervous about this, um, but it seemed, I remember when, when the America's Army game came out and reading about it, I was like, wow, this is a serious game. Like something, there's something to do in this game and I wasn't sure what it was. And then, you know, the confluence of events just made, it just made sense. Um, what generally would happen is I would play, I would sometimes uh, get uh, verbal questions or comments from other players. This is something that again and again, people would say, this is a game, this is a game, this is a game, you know? You know, we, we come to this space to get away from that. Why are you doing this? Um, really good sort of questioning. And, and that would actually energize me because I knew they were paying attention. Um, <laughs> Sometimes very hostile. Uh, Jesus, shut up already. We get it. People die. Um, hmm, so what's your point? Um, dead, please. This is not the forum to do this. I don't give a fuck. Man, will all the hackers go play ping pong or something? Um, these kind of reactions were, were, were typical. Um, and I knew I had gotten through to everyone in that particular game space when I would get kicked because everyone in the game space had to vote to kick me. Um, and so this was kind of a, a victory in a way. Um, this was very intense experience. Um, started privately, quietly, and it's then got on these game blogs and, and began to be written about in the popular press. Uh, there were stories written about it by salon.com, wired.com. It got on uh, CNN, NPR, uh, CBC in Canada. It really kind of exploded in, in, in the media sphere in, in a very scary and, and kind of interesting way because that to me became this ultimate way of disseminating this work which I viewed as a protest and a memorial. Um, it was always focused on in the media as a protest and I would always, you know, it's also a memorial. You sit there and you read these thousands of names and actually type them in one at a time carefully. Um, it is an, it, it essentially when those names are in here, it's, to me, analogous to the names carved in uh, granite on the memorial, right? It just, it's there, it's fleeting, it's gone. Um, this was intense. Um, I would say a life-changing work for me. Um, I was getting probably 50-50 very abusive emails and very supportive emails and um, really, really intense. Um, I'm kind of jumping around a little bit here, but I, I landed up uh, still working on this project, but as a, a resident at IBEAM in New York City, and I met uh, Steve Lambert and one of the Yes Men and some other artists, activists who were working on this great project, the fake New York Times. You guys aware of this project? Um, mm -hmm. Amazing, right? So they got about, there's about 60 different people involved in this project, and they created a perfect copy of the New York Times, but from a sort of liberal, utopian, progressive position. It's all the news we hope to print, uh, or hope to see, or something. Um, and it's all, you know, these, these great things. And I proposed a, an article for this, and actually wrote a piece, uh, Popular America's Army Video Game Recruiting Tool Cancelled. And uh, America's Army Game would be replaced by a new game called America's Diplomat. Um, <laughs> And this link in the online version of the New York Times, fake New York Times, went to a fake American <laughs> diplomat website, um, which, which is actually, I basically took the America's Army website as a template and built this over it. So it's the identical design, just different content. And if you click on it, you would get to this blog thing where you could kind of make comments. And there were, it was great because there were like, Couple of people like, when's this game coming out? You know, like, <laughs> um, but again, it's like this playing with our like, what what is our what's important? Like, what do we see as important? Um, 
Why don't we have this? Why do we have that? Um, another kind of peripheral project, um, there, there, there's actually, America's Army is still going strong. There's comic books, there's action figures, there's um, trucks that drive around with these mobile kind of shooting gallery game things where you can sit in a Humvee and all this kind of stuff. Um, but I took the action figures and these were actually not soldiers who died, but soldiers who survived the conflict. Um, but I created a different kind of America's Army figure actually based on one of those screenshots you, uh, you saw previously. Um, so it's like a, it's a different kind of action figure. Uh, curious thing with this, it became a kind of accidental intervention. Um, I was doing a search online for America's Army action figure and an image search for a talk I was doing and, and this is what came up and it was really, it was fascinating to me because it's like the actual America's Army stuff and then there's my work and there's my work and there's my work, you know, and it's like this odd infection of the media sphere unintentionally. Um, which comes into play in some work I'll show you in, in a moment. Um, this is a large scale uh, Pepecure cardboard version of my fallen avatar based on the actual data that was shown in uh, Beijing, China. Um, the other work that I was doing at this time consecutively was IraqiMemorial.org. And again, just to bring you back to this, remember this and again that thought of like there, there would never be this for the many thousands of civilian casualties dying in the war. And, my, and I did have this initial thought, like do like the New York Times, just do like a switcheroo, like take that website code and put in different content and put it up there as an intervention. But I, I moved quickly away from that because the, it just was too serious to um, just do a kind of satire. Um, so just some estimates, right? 9-11, uh, WTC, uh, World Trade Center attacks, and these are various numbers that have been estimated as far as the number of civilian casualties in the Iraq conflict. Um, this is devastating, right? And, and it calls for some, a, a, a very thoughtful, creative response. So I created this website and called for participation. IraqiMemorial.org uh, launched in fall of 2007, if I remember correctly. And this was a open call for anyone artists, architects, whoever, to propose an imagined memorial to the civilian casualties in Iraq. Um, it's got a, just about 200 proposals and projects on it. Uh, at this time, it really exists as an archive. Um, Paula is actually one of the artists who participated in this project. There's some really extraordinary work on here. And one of the interesting things that sort of shifted is I was thinking proposals, but I man almost immediately began to get artists sending me projects they had been working on like things they had done. And so I, I expanded my sense of what thinking of artworks as being a kind of idea, proposal, it just seemed the right thing to do. And for example, like this is Matt Kenyon, extraordinary artist um, and now friend who made, uh, I'll just talk about this one project briefly, he manufactured actual eight and a half by 11 yellow pads, right? But the, the lines of the pads are microtext of the names of Iraqi civilian casualties. And he managed somehow to get these pads put into the office supplies of the US Congress. So that our, your senators, their aides were writing. And everything that is written on all of this stuff at the Congress goes into the National Archive. So it's like this subterfuge that I think was just brilliant as, as, a, as a memorial. A couple other projects, but you can go look at the website yourself if you'd like to see more of these projects. We did turn this into a physical exhibition um, inviting artists <laughs> whose works were identified by our, our, our jurors, and, and they, there was no winner, right? Because this would never actually be built, um, to be honest, right? Um, but these jurors were invited to choose their top 10 favorite entries those artists were then invited to recreate their proposals as a 30 by 40 inch board, same size as the 9-11 call. And we had, uh, there's a traveling exhibition that started at the Shepherd Gallery in uh, Reno. And uh, the second and probably most significant stop, this was at the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts, opened on um, September 9th, 2011, two days before the dedication of the 9-11 Memorial in New York City. 
So across town from where we were remembering our own dead, we were remembering the other, right? Um, and this was extraordinary. There were artists who came down and did performances, and then we had artifacts, um, had a panel discussion. It was uh, really quite quite something, and and extraordinary to see the way artists were responding to this issue. Um, we also did a, a, a version of, of this exhibition in San Jose at, at Works Gallery. Um, I'm hoping that eventually this physical manifestation of the exhibition will land up in an archive somewhere and, and hopefully be shown again. Um, reenactment. Uh, so when I was doing the America's Army thing and getting all of these insults, and, and one of the things that I would do with these stories like a Salon and Wired is there would be the comments were just off the charts, right? I mean, just people were, someone should go break this guy's legs, it's unpatriotic, um, you know, why don't you, you know, go, go protest on the steps of the federal building, that type of thing. And I started like reading these things and I'm like, okay, do I respond? Well, I did. And I decided that that would be a kind of extension of the dissemination of the work. And, and the opportunity to maybe have some dialogue. And so I did, I, I basically went in, so I'm the one doing this and here's why. And it became this, I mean, I was at least able to ratchet down some people who wanted to break my legs to agreeing that we disagree, but that it was my constitutional right and my responsibility as a citizen to be expressing you know, these views. Um, and in one of these, uh, one of these comment experiences, going back and forth with this guy, at one point he says, dude, you got a Gandhi complex. And it's like just one of those things that's kind of like, really? Like that, you think that's an insult, right? Um, <laughs> you know, I just sort of blew me away. And, and you know, at the same time, I was doing a lot of reading about the history of protest and, you know, in, in really in the 20th century, and, all roads lead to Gandhi, right? I mean, he, you know, he's seminal in terms of the techniques, the processes, and, and a way, and, and a way of embracing protest and conflict with a sense of joy, right? That these two works, Dead in Iraq and, and Iraq and Memorial, were both put me in a very dark place. You know, I mean, I was working with death for like two solid years, and it was intense. Um, and, and, and reading about Gandhi and just, it was just like uplifting and anyway. So these things all kind of came together and I created this project, Gandhi and Second Life. And this is, this is my avatar that I made in Second Life. Um, and what I did was I proposed to IBEAM in New York City for a residency to reenact Gandhi's salt march in Second Life. Um, and eventually, uh, it was actually a student, a former student who suggested, why don't you do it on a treadmill? I was like, oh, that's fantastic. And so worked to essentially create a, to transform a walk fit uh, treadmill into a game controller. And essentially my steps became Gandhi's steps. And over 26 days, I essentially reenacted Gandhi's salt march, and I walked uh, 240 miles, uh, 10 miles a day for 24 days. I took the same rest days he took with his followers. His followers begged him to take rest days, by the way, because they were so exhausted. Um, so I was in I-beam in a public space on this treadmill, basically following my Gandhi avatar and gui guiding him through this space about eight to 10 hours a day, and interacting with other residents of Second Life inviting them to join my group, giving them a gift of my walking stick, and um, really, I saw Second Life, like firsthand. Uh, and if you're not familiar with Second Life, it's an enormous virtual community. Um, came out about the same time as Facebook, and um, it's, uh, at the time, it had the same contiguous space as Singapore. Um, so I walked everywhere. Like in Second Life, you're supposed to fly and teleport. My personal rules were essentially that I would walk. And so I did. And what started as this kind of conceptual performance piece became transformative in the sense that I, <laughs> I, I was 
literally <coughs> so absorbed in my avatar that you know when he would like try to walk over a mountain and fall off, I would almost fall off the treadmill. Um, it was extraordinary in that, contrary to the America's Army experience, in this space, Gandhi was welcomed everywhere. Like, everyone was like, oh, Gandhi, what's up? What you doing? You know, and I, and so I explained to him, oh, my human's on a treadmill making me go. We're reenacting, da, da, and oh, can I walk with you? And so I had all kinds of people from all over the world joining me for various, some people for several weeks, some people for a day. Um, and it was just kind of magical, but also infected my consciousness. I, I found myself, after leaving IBEAM and going back to my apartment, where I'd be walking down the street and thinking that I could click on people to get information, right? <laughs> um, um, like, you know, having deja vu going down the stairs of the subway. Um, but I literally just, I walked, I ate, I slept, I came back the next day, I walked, I ate, I, you know, it was just, it was, it was really intensely, an intense experience performatively. And just as a, there wasn't really, I wasn't protesting anything, it was more like an exploration about what, what would this be like? Like what, if, if you can be anything in these virtual contexts, why can't me, this middle-aged white guy, be Gandhi? I mean, that's, there's, you know, the 1980s multiculturalist trained MFA student of me was kind of cringing at the whole idea, right? Um, but it was interesting. I think those are edges we kind of have to look at. At the end of this um, performance piece, I was invited to have an exhibition at IBEAM, and honestly, I miss Gandhi, right? And so I used some open source software to actually extract the Gandhi data, my avatar data, from Second Life, and I wanted to create an enormous sculpture, and a, and a, a fellow resident at IBEAM suggested I look at this program called Pepecura Designer, which that's one of the results there. It takes any 3D model and sort of flattens it out into these paper craft patterns that you can fold and glue together. Generally, people make things like this big. And I, I basically worked, created a, a, a process with an overhead projector and old-fashioned transparencies to transmit this to large-scale 4 by 8 sheets of cardboard, which then translated to the creation of a 17-foot-tall reproduction of my avatar. Um, and it made him the same height as Michelangelo's David, um, <laughs> which I thought was an appropriate another David and Goliath kind of situation. Um, and it really captured some essence of this experience. I mean, it really, and, and, and it was again, it was like the march was this physical process and the build of this sculpture was extremely physical, like six weeks of hard labor. Um, it's just fantastic. Finished this and I got invited to uh, show Gandhi in an exhibition in Guangzhou, China, a wonderful uh, triennial at the Guangzhou Museum. And I was like, oh, fantastic. Uh, I built him in pieces, he's packable, you know, he's very light, he's just kind of big. And they said, no, we want you to come build another one. And I was like, <laughs> it's like, you've got to be kidding. But, um, so I did. Um, <laughs> and it was actually amazing, because this one, as opposed to one in New York, it was built by a community of workers, of museum workers and volunteers. And it became this kind of social engagement towards building Gandhi. And the crowds loved him, they actually landed up uh, acquiring him for their permanent collection. And um, it was really in an amazing space, amazing show. And then there was another curator who saw this and said, come build one in Belgium. And I was like, sure. So I um, actually built this third one uh, in the Art Academy in Mechelen, Belgium, with students and faculty. And they started him before I came and, and worked with them for the last week. Uh, he, this one actually eventually was transported to uh, Belfast, Ireland for ISEA. And um, he, was, he had been up for a long time in Belgium and he was showing signs of wear. So when I left him, I said, please, he needs to be, he needs to be destroyed. Um, but I don't want him you know, going into the landfill. Could you please be sure you recycle all the material? And there was one of the students who helped put this back together he said to me, hey, I'm involved in guerrilla gardening projects in Belfast. I'll make sure the cardboard gets in our compost, which is fantastic to think about Belfast, Ireland, this location of conflict where some median somewhere, there's flowers growing on Gandhi. You know, that just, I love that. Um, 
Moving into more recent works, uh, 2011, I, I uh, went on a residency in Beijing, China, um, and was working. These are essentially um, trying a different material with the same process. Um, this is white corrugated plastic, um, but these are actually the hands. I was, became more and more fascinated with the physical manifestation of our fears as represented represented in the enemies in shooter games. So these are actually hands extracted from a Taliban fighter from a Medal of Honor game that came out in 2010. And, and they're, they're, they're like this in the game, holding a pistol. And when I sculpted them, they were just so beautiful in this kind of repose that that's how they have been shown ever since. Um, these are the same pieces actually shown last fall in Mexico City at the Central Cultural España and they suspended them over these um, temple steps. This is just off the main square in, uh, in Mexico City. You can't walk on this, and, and it's like they've never shown anything in here, and they suspended them over these steps, and um, they really, really had an amazing kind of uh, presence. Um, oops. So this is kind of, just to show you, this is some of the data extracted from one of these games put into Blender. But that's the kind of representation you're dealing with. I, I really want to create an enormous um, terrorist at some point extracted from one of these games. And I've actually been working on a, a kind of a, a, a half-scale version of, of such in my studio in Reno. And this is actually a, a Taliban fighter uh, that, that is not, not yet finished, um, but hopefully will be shown somewhere eventually. Um, really quick. Um, this was a huge failure. Uh, I ran a virtual Senate candidate in the uh, Harry Reid, Sharon Angle uh, uh, Senate campaign. Um, Nevada is the only state in the union where the choice on all federal ballots you have none of these candidates, right? So I thought, why not create a candidate called none of these candidates? Right? <laughs> um, anyway, he had some interesting positions. Um, one of which was based on this quote. Um, Cliff Chan of the Union Concerned Scientists. If a concentrated solar power system was built that was 100 mile by 100 mile square in size, this would be more than enough to meet the country's entire energy demand. He also says in the Southwest desert, essentially. Um, and so that was one of the things that my candidate was proposing was big solar for Nevada, which would be the largest solar farm in the world made in the shape of the BP logo starting at the edge of the Nevada test site and taking over this portion of Nevada. Um, this became a, a different project. Uh, it, it led to basically kind of enacting this in, in a very different way. Because that idea, that notion of a 100 mile by 100 mile square solar farm that could provide us enough electricity seemed reasonable to me. So I started looking at the map and started looking at like what, is that, what does that translate to? And lo and behold, this, the Nellis Air Force Range in southern Nevada, is essentially that amount of square miles. It's the largest peace, uh, peacetime military installation in the world. Um, it's where you have the Nevada Test Site, Area 51, um, Yucca Mountain, etc. Well, you know, this is where all of our nuclear bombs, most of our nuclear bombs, the vast majority, have been detonated in the continent of the United States. Um, there's been 928 announced. Uh, above and below ground tests, it's Nevada test site. Um, the Creech Air Force Base is one of the main locuses for controlling and training for drone warfare. Uh, so basically right now there are drones flying around on the other side of the planet that are being controlled from southern Nevada. Um, of course Area 51, Groom Lake, which of course we all think about as where all the flying saucers are hidden and all that kind of crap. Um, the reality is much more interesting. Uh, this is where all of our surveillance aircraft have been tested and basically vetted for use, including uh, the AR-71, the U-2 spy plane, all of our drones, everything started here. Um, that got me thinking of along other lines, but I'll get to that. So this is my response and my idea, essentially, was to take to the roads surrounding the Nellis Air Force Range, uh, which amounted to 460 miles of, 
of writing. That's as close as I could get to the to surrounding on, on existing roads. Um, and essentially, I equipped a long tail bicycle uh, with a spring loaded and string operated mechanism with homemade pieces of, of white chalk and solar panels on the bike that actually charge the batteries to power the GoPro cameras and electronics, etc., GPS location. And I set out to surround the Nellis Air Force Range on my bike by an enormous line of chalk uh, as a way of identifying, imagining, reimagining this space to be used for something else, right? We make this decision to dedicate this huge swatch of land towards military based purposes, bombing, uh, dogfight training, et cetera. Why couldn't we do this? I mean, and so it was an incredibly strenuous bike ride, windy, hot, um, pretty amazing. My, uh, my wife, Lori, who is here tonight, was instrumental in keeping me alive, um, literally like guzzling Gatorade. Um, it, was, uh, it was quite an experience. Um, there's a video on the website. I'm actually not going to show this right now, so we don't spend too much time. Um, but that was that work is also feeding into some new work, which I'll get to talking about in a moment here. This was my first point of really getting very interested in drones in my work um, because of the research on Area 51 specifically and Creech Air Force Base. It just was like this history of them and how they're being utilized. Um, had always really troubled me, but this was the first response creatively. Um, I simply took an image of uh, a predator drone uh, off of Google, and I used military font and Photoshop to create a new type of insignia that just really kind of, to me, called attention to exactly what these things really are. Um, and it just, just was like a one-off thing. I didn't think it did. And then, then I started thinking about that America's Army action figure thing, right, where that just sort of started appearing. And I thought, what if I just started creating, you know, multiples of just taking the top search hits for predator drones, uh, uh, et cetera, off of Google and reconfiguring them and then posting them back on my website, would they eventually go up that search chain to where they would intervene in, in the search? Um, so there are, uh, I think I've got maybe about 10 of these done, um, but here's a number of them that I have put on my website um, and to see if this will eventually kind of intervene in that space. And curiously, if you guys know about this image, but that's like one of the most popular images of a drone that has been used in the media and the Defense Department's own publications, and it's fake. It's fantastic. Uh, James Bridle actually figured this out and contacted the artist who made this. It's a 3D model, and it's all 3D. It's basically all 3D rendered, um, but it's been used. It's appeared over and over again because it's the first image that comes up on Google. Um, but peripheral to this, because I landed up doing this with it without knowing that. Um, it's starting to work. This search today, and there's one of them showing up there. Um, I, I want to get back to putting more of these out there because I really I think that sense of people coming stumbling across this and saying what you know what you know that 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 will hopefully get into people's heads. Um, done a number of drone projects in the last year. I was invited to participate in a show at the uh, Florida State Art Museum called Making Now, um, and basically I proposed to them a the creation of a very simple paper cutout in a participatory memorial where individuals were invited to cut out this drone shape, fold it, um, and write the name of a drone, of a Pakistani civilian drone casualty on the wings. And then they would string these all together to create an installation that where the name 1000 Drones Project comes from the 1000 cranes, right? I was thinking, sort of playing with that notion of the cranes as being this wish for peace um, you know, and that kind of saying something about drones by kind of appropriating that for this work. And the extraordinary thing about this project, I was there when they launched it. I gave a lecture like this and then passed these out and they made some, but they put the whole thing together in my absence. Um, and they had hundreds of people participating 
And uh, they sent me the photographs, and, and it just actually blew me away. Um, it's really intense that this was a, a uh, and, and, and this is not all of the casualties, the civilian casualties in Pakistan. This was the ones that have been named, right? So um, anyway, it's just it's an intense piece, and actually they mailed it back to me. I hope to maybe restage this or remake this elsewhere. Um, and this project that was commissioned last spring by CSU Fresno, sorry, they don't call themselves that anymore, Fresno State University, excuse me. Um, I was corrected many times by their branding police, but um, the, uh, I was invited to create a public, temporary public sculpture in Fresno, and what I proposed was to create a life-size predator drone out of yellow corrugated plastic which would be built on site with volunteers um, and basically kind of mimic this extraordinary video. If you go on YouTube and look for uh, Afghan, I think it's Afghanistan villagers stoning predator drone. This is a crashed predator drone and the villagers are actually stoning it. And, and I look, just the look of this thing, this kind of like, it just sort of like fell from the sky and it's just like, um, it, emasculated um, really intrigued me. So we kind of duplicated that in the process of installation. We built this over two weeks um, last spring. Very intense, uh, <laughs> wonderful work crew, um, amazing experience, some really huge technical challenges working that big with this material. Um, but the piece was eventually installed on the campus and we then had a ceremony where um, some Pakistani expats, actually local uh, Fresno folks, read the names of uh, civilian drone casualties on a card, which was then handed to volunteers who then wrote the information directly onto the surface of the drone. And there were dozens of children, you know? I mean, it just, it was really intense. Uh, and so the, the drone was covered with the names uh, as, as a temporary memorial. Um, this was intense, uh, quite recent and actually quite an emotional project. Um, met some wonderful people. Uh, each name, by the way, was transferred, I'm sorry, translated. Um, it just, this was just an incredible piece. Um, and volunteers and people worked, I mean, it, it was just this, really great participatory project and they, they they it was their work as much as mine i mean and they were invested in it you know these these students and volunteers they would come back they helped me install it um here the, here's a piece at night um and it landed up turning up on uh, google earth uh, someone had alerted me to this it was this was actually the day we were assembling it um so it was quite interesting and the extraordinary thing here in Fresno, the campus is constantly being flown over by um, national, Air National Guard jets, like five days a week. The base is like right there and they fly right over the base. So I mean, they were, you know they were seeing this, um, which was uh, quite, uh, quite interesting. Um, and when we removed the piece, there was this really interesting drone shadow of Mon that had not had sun for uh, two months. Um, Finally, a uh, couple last pieces. So this I just finished this week. Um, as mentioned in the intro, I'm currently an artist in residence at Instructables uh, down on Pier 9. Uh, an amazing place to work. Uh, this is a piece I've been thinking about for some time. It was like a way to coast, kind of get my juices going uh, down there. But um, basically, I created a kind of headband, sea clamp type thing that attaches to my head a carbon fiber rod is about three feet and I created a, a finely detailed uh, built in an atelier um, 172nd scale predator drone that attaches to the top of this and so it's like having my own drone follow me around and you know wait there's a drone oh it's not there right it's kind of <laughs> this, this thing so um, and I uh, walked around down Fisherman's Wharf and had a bunch of photographs taken, and there's actually um, um, 
If you haven't been to Instructables, instructables.com, go check it out and put in me and my predator, which is what I called it. And I put an Instructable up, like how to make your own drone. And read the comments. The comments are just fantastic. Because um, there's like those who kind of get it and those who like, why would I want to put this on my head? You know, that kind of um, So it, it's, it's another context for sharing, sharing work that you know is idea based is, is concept based um, just some other things I'm working on right now um, there's some various 3d prints of drones <coughs> that are trying out different materials that one there has about a one and a half foot wingspan uh, Taliban hands that I'm working on uh, some smaller prints about this big that I just painted gray for uh, silver leafing and this is actually another towel on hand done with the one, two, three D make process that I'm actually covering with um, mulberry paper, like a Noguchi lamp process kind of thing. And this one is actually a, I'm using their M core printer I'm making right now. It's actually still printing a 40 hour long print of one of the Taliban hands, but it's out of essentially layers of regular printer paper that are glued one at a time and cut, glued, cut, glued, cut. Um, and the, the, the objects have an extraordinary kind of physicality to them, so I'm very excited about that. Um, but all these works are part of what I'm researching right now is, is for a new project um, that I propose to Instructables. Uh, so after doing that experience at the Nellis Air Force Range, I started thinking more about our military presence and the use of bases and, and physical land. Um, I started finding this amazing information. So uh, this is a map that essentially shows the presence of the US military abroad. And, and according to the De Defense Department's own document from 2011, out of 196 countries in the world, there are US military troops stationed in 150, um, which I thought was just kind of shocking, right? Um, so my proposal, to uh, Instructables in this larger project that's probably about a five year long project is to try to visit all 150 countries and find these military uh, bases, uh, troops stationed at other bases in foreign countries, etc. Photograph, video, and 3D scan, right? To, to actually kind of capture, it's kind of like a documentary, but in 3D, like to try to capture objects, places, things, meet people, uh, create essentially an archive of our military access abroad. Um, and I'm calling, I call a project mapping the American empire. I contacted a representative of uh, Ramstein Air Force Base two, three weeks ago, because I'm flying through there to Dubai for a conference in October. I'm trying to get entry to the base as a start to the project. Um, but I retitled the piece Mapping Strength, Documenting US Military Abroad. Mm -hmm because actually the report I'm working from is about troop strengths abroad, and it just seems using that language is a little more sensible. Um, I'm waiting to hear back, actually, at this point from the Secretary of Public Affairs for the, the entire Air Force that they directed me uh, to uh, query. So I keep my fingers crossed on that. Even if I don't get permission, I think just going to these places and you know taking pictures of the front gate communicates, or facing the other way, right? That's, so it's going to happen one way or the other. Um, that's what I'm working on now. I got some other projects in the work as what works as well. Probably talk too long, um, but thank you very much, and uh, glad to answer any questions. And.